McQuistion, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistion is made possible in part by individual viewers. Supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television. The Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government. Hillcrest Foundation, founded by Mrs. W. W. Carruth. And Collin County Business Press, locally relevant, personally profitable. You know, no matter where you are in the world, the current economic situation is affecting you. It's January 20th, 2009 here in the studio, the night of the inauguration of Barack Obama. Even he is telling Americans that things may get worse before hope and change make them better. But the first question we must ask and answer is what caused the problem, which is being compared to the Great Depression, of course. Fiscal and monetary crises are not new topics on this program. And before we meet our experts today, let's take a look back at how I closed the program in October of 2007. As someone who has been around the financial services industry for his entire life, I must say that this situation appalls me. The ineptness, the fraud, the poor public policy decisions, and the sheer lack of doing what's right have led to a difficult situation which only promises to get worse before it gets better. Now, I sincerely hope that we don't have a depression because of real estate in the next two or three years, but if we do, remember that you heard it here first. Thanks for asking us in to talk about things that matter with people who care. Well, you know, we've been in an official recession now for over a year, and joining us by phone is Bob Higgs. Bob Higgs is a senior fellow in political economy for the Independent Institute, and he's editor of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. He received his Ph.D. in economics from Johns Hopkins University. He's taught at the University of Washington, Lafayette College, Seattle University, and the University of Economics in Prague. He's an award-winning writer, and his popular articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Providence Journal, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Examiner, Reason, and many others. He's been on NBC, ABC, C-SPAN, and all that, and been on this program before, too. Bob, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll bring you back in in a minute, and I'm sure you have no controversial information to share, so hang with us if you don't mind. In the studio with us this evening is Professor Stan Leibowitz. He's the Ash Bell Smith Professor of Economics in the Business School at the University of Texas at Dallas. He's published numerous academic articles and books, and his research has been the focus of stories in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, and a program on the BBC, among many other media outlets. He's written a book chapter about the mortgage crisis that was condensed into the cover story of the National Review last month. He's one of the very few economists who warned in the 1990s of a potentially disastrous increase in mortgage foreclosures due to the federal government's attempts at weakening mortgage underwriting standards. You can put them together for Stan Leibowitz here in the, if you would like to. <laughs> and sitting next to him is the guy who caused all this. He's Richard Bittner. He's a 15-year veteran of the mortgage lending industry, and he currently serves as the associate publisher for Housing Wire magazine. As the author of this book, and I, if I can hold it up for you here, Confessions of a Subprime Lender, if you can read that from where you are sitting there at home, uh, An Insider's Tale of Greed, Fraud, and Ignorance. He brings a wealth of knowledge on the inner workings of the mortgage finance industry. Richard, welcome to the program. You can give him a round of applause, too. Thank you. You know, whether he deserves it or not. Now, is it not true that you mortgage folks caused all this problem? Well, you know, we certainly did. And, uh, but I, I think it's important to understand is that uh, it wasn't just us. It was certainly Wall Street. There was a lot of, uh, lot of culprits in this. Yeah. Well, take us back a bit, if you don't mind, Richard, and give that viewer some idea of the way things were before we had this situation. What did the mortgage business look like when it was more legitimate than it is today? Absolutely. And I think in some respects, we almost uh, might want to jump back 30 or 40 years to uh, the time when uh, you as citizens or, or we as uh, uh, potential homeowners would go down the street and get the loan from the bank. And the reason I mention that is that at the time, what was so significant about that era was that the responsibility around that loan was largely tied to one institution, which meant that bank, that institution, made the loan, they serviced the loan, they funded the loan, and if they had to, they foreclosed on the loan. So they truly had the responsibility at every level. Well, with the advent of securitization, which by and large wasn't necessarily a bad thing, it's one of the things that did intelligently help to increase home ownership in this country, it took that responsibility with one institution and it broke it up amongst a whole host of parties. And what it also did is it kind of diluted the responsibility amongst a lot of players. And when we started seeing the growth of securitization, especially in the late 90s, 
we started seeing a lot of things that happened, and I know my counterpart here is going to talk a little bit more about some of those things, but relative to the lending side, what we saw over the course of the last five to ten years was a process by which the, the line between what was and what was not acceptable from a risk standpoint slowly started to move. And hopefully as we go through the show, we can talk a little bit more about what drove those decisions. It was largely initially uh, driven by uh, the folks on Wall Street. And I think that's one of the important points we need to make is that what was able to be sold and packaged into a mortgage-backed security and sold as a bond to investors worldwide was ultimately what dictated to uh, what, what became available to folks here on, on Main Street. Okay, now Richard, in your book, one of the things that you talk about is that you would interview people and let's just say you interviewed some people who are less than than prime borrowers but you said there are a couple of things that you look for if you're really trying to make a loan to somebody and do a favor for them what are those two things you look for yeah you know it's interesting because a lot of times when you're sitting and you're meeting with somebody who doesn't have very good credit and that does become a question of you know where's the dividing line a lot of times it came down to some very basic things number one can the person afford to live in this house can they afford to make that payment and are we putting this person in a better position than they were when they walked in the door and if the answer to those two questions even through all of the muck was yes at least hopefully you could sleep with a, a little better at night that you've made a fairly intelligent risk decision and then would it be fair to say that you saw a lot of people who were your peers in the industry who didn't exactly ask or answer those questions or didn't care about the answers well there certainly was a lot of that and, and I think one of the challenges you know we saw the proliferation of what we call the stated income loan the loan where people didn't have to prove income and it didn't matter whether it was on the subprime side or even people who had good credit you know I use my I think I use the figures an example of my company when I started my firm in 2000 roughly 20 percent of our business maybe now maybe 15 to 20 percent were roughly those types of loans where borrowers were not required to prove income by the time I left in late 2005 it was roughly 35 40 percent of our business it was largely which was indicative of what was happening in the industry so clearly one of the main problems we ran into exactly now Stan you have written a, a great article which people can get online uh, through the Independent Institute as well something called anatomy of a train wreck uh, sort of dissect that problem for us Right. The, uh, the basic problem, as, uh, as we just heard, was that lending, uh, loans were being given to people who really couldn't afford to make the payments. And the question is, how is it that they were able to get those loans? Now, the bankers or the mortgage lenders may have been the ones who actually provided the loan, but at one time, when Richard, as Richard was saying, you didn't get loans like that. And so the question is, what happened that at one time you didn't get loans and all of a sudden those loans became plentiful? And if you take a look, in the early 1990s, the government tried very hard, almost every branch of the government and the, uh, the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, to lower the lending standards. They wanted to increase home ownership. And uh, home ownership, if it, you know, to increase it, it's going to lead to several things. First of all, in order to have more people in homes, you have to somehow change something either you can make houses cheaper so they can afford it or you can give them more money and those would be expensive for the government to do so it took a third route to try to increase home ownership and the route it took was it was going to make it easier for people who normally wouldn't be able to afford a mortgage to get one and so they started to lower the mortgage lending standards and so there's a, a document by the Boston Fed where they're outlining how banks should change their mortgage lending and they say things like you don't have to really have verifiable income. Uh, you can take a look at whether they've been paying their bills. You can look at sources of income that really aren't stable sources of income. So unemployment insurance, that can be used as income, even though you may not get it for another three months, uh, any more than three months. They, uh, they said, uh, do you have a credit history? That's not important necessarily. There are some people in this country who keep their money under their bed. And if so, they don't use credit cards, they don't have banks, they don't really need a credit history. And so you should be flexible. And that was the term they used. They wanted flexible underwriting standards. And the flexible underwriting standard turned into the loans where you don't have to provide any documentation, you don't have to make any down payment, uh, you don't have to really be able to afford it in the normal sense. Uh, and it, the low down payment, the zero, three percent down payment was probably the main killer there. Okay, the main killer there. All right, now I'm going to quote, uh, I'm going to show you some quotes from your report, and why don't you read those to us and then give us some uh, sense of what you wrote here. So if we were, let's look at number 25, graphic number 25. Okay, actually read it. It's the thesis of this report that this large increase in defaults had been a potential problem waiting to happen for some time. The reason is that mortgage underwriting standards had been undermined by virtually every branch of the government since the early 1990s. Okay, you got another one there behind it. 
The government had been attempting to increase home ownership in the U.S., which had been stagnant for several decades. In particular, the government had tried to increase home ownership among poor and minority Americans. Although a seemingly noble goal, the tool chosen to achieve this goal was one that endangered the entire mortgage enterprise, intentional weakening of the traditional mortgage lending standards. Okay, so, uh, Stan, I mean, I, I, I assume that probably what happened is the government, the government, whatever the government is, just sort of, it just oozed out that they wanted this to happen, or was it some individuals in particular who encouraged this, and or um, what were their reasons for wanting this to happen? Is it just totally benevolence on their part that they wanted to make more home ownership available? There's a, a mixture here. It's, it's hard to say for sure. In terms of who it was, it, there were a lot of people involved. Um, at first it was obviously the people of the Boston Fed, the people who had done a study saying that we needed to weaken the mortgage. That's 1992. Standards. That's right. Okay, uh, let and me then stop on that for just a second. Now, now, you and I know this, and for those, and I think most people watching this program know that I'm a recovering banker. And I remember well when the study was written in 1992, and a guy named Richard Siren, I believe, was the president of the Boston Fed at the time. Yes or no? Yes, he was. Right, what they said, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that some of these bankers, mortgage brokers maybe, but mostly bankers back in those days and thrifts are redlining basically. They're not making loans in certain parts of town. They're not making loans to certain income groups, et cetera. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Was that data that they had accurate? Yes or no? It was inaccurate. The data that the Boston Fed used, uh, they went and collected special data. There was already government collected data, but it was insufficient to be able to answer the question as to whether or not the higher rejection rates for poor and minority applicants, because there were higher rejection rates, uh, was due to discrimination or due to the fact that they were just weaker in terms of ability to pay back the mortgage. The Boston Fed went out and collected new numbers to try to answer that question. Uh, and they did a study such that if the numbers they had were good, they could have actually tried to answer it. But what happened was they went to banks and said, give us new numbers on other variables, such as credit history and whatnot. And then somebody had to sit there and transcribe those numbers into a form that the computer could read. And somewhere between the banks giving them the numbers and the numbers getting into the computer, nobody was double checking. And what happened when we looked at the data that the Boston Fed used in its analysis was that there were just hundreds and hundreds of obvious errors. Loans where the amount that had to be paid back was zero. Loans where the interest rate was negative. Loans where people were getting who had minus $5 million net worth and had incomes of $20,000 a year. Loans that were being sold in the secondary market, according to the data, but had been rejected. And of course, you can't reject a loan that hasn't been made. You can't resell a loan because it hasn't been made. Yeah. So there were lots and lots of these problems. Lots, lots of problems there. But, but it's typically the case, uh, bad precedent in one governmental agency, in this case the Fed, becomes, I mean, bad, bad work, I should say, bad statistics becomes a precedent in other places saying, we need to do something about this. So we had, an, we had a law that was passed in 1977 called the Community Reinvestment Act. Yes? Yes. Under Jimmy Carter. And I was a banker full time back in those days. And it basically said, you guys ought to make loans to people who don't really deserve. Is this true, Richard, or That's not? That's correct, yeah. Okay. And so the banks did a little of that, but it wasn't until the 90s, after this particular thing at the, at the Boston Fed was written, that they put teeth into this thing. And I'm going to talk to Bob Higgs about that in just a minute. But I want to tell you a story, first of all, about a banker friend of mine who happens to be in this audience tonight and who does not have the guts to stand up and tell this story himself, okay? So I'm going to tell it to you. And I'm not going to point the person out or mention the bank either. So there we are. But what happened with him is the examiners came in in the 90s and basically said, you guys are not making enough bad loans in this particular part of town. And so in order to solve that problem, they encouraged them to join in a community association of some type who was making sure that we got um, I hate to use the word extortion, but it is the best word. And so, <laughs> consequently, you take money and give it to a community group, you join the group, and all of a sudden the regulator said you're okay. Now, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. Now, Bob, I'm going to come to you. You have, maybe you want to tie into this thing, and then you have one other big cause of the problem that you want to talk about. Tell us about it. Well, uh, the, the aspects that have struck me uh, most forcefully, Dennis, uh, uh, have been mentioned in part already uh, in terms of the uh, government officials who, who put pressure on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and uh, in, uh, indirectly uh, on lending institutions themselves, the uh, initiators of the loans, 
the pressure to to make these loans to people with low income or uh, people who hadn't qualified under traditional lending standards and uh, certainly we can identify some of the people who were most influential in, in congress uh, particularly uh, not in the 90s which you've been discussing but uh, more uh, after the uh, the beginning of the present decade, and uh, several of these individuals are on record now in a very embarrassing way, and I have in mind uh, particularly Representative uh, Barney Frank in the House and uh, Senator Christopher Dodd and uh, Senator Charles Schumer in the Senate. All these individuals uh, were very forceful in uh, their hearings in uh, Putting pressure on uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie to to uh, solicit uh, to purchase more of these uh, subprime loans and Alt A loans uh, to make it possible for the uh, loan initiators to 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 make the loans and then to shed the risk immediately by reselling the. Uh, securities to uh, the secondary market so bob, we, bob hold on just one second let me for that person watching who who is all everybody's heard fannie mae and freddie mac give us just a brief bit of who they are number one and how big a player in the mortgage business they are in this country well uh, fannie mae is a a government-sponsored enterprise uh, created uh, during the new deal in the 1930s and it was then that the federal government first became involved in uh, attempting to subsidize this so-called American dream of making home ownership uh, nearly universal. And uh, Fannie Mae was uh, a big part of that uh, government effort then, and uh, it was uh, created to do what it continued to do for decades and, and still does, uh, which is to repurchase uh, notes that... Uh, lending institutions receive when they make loans uh, so that uh, it creates a secondary market and therefore uh, more liquidity in the home uh, mortgage lending market overall. Uh, so Fannie Mae goes back to the 1930s. Freddie Mac was created later in the post-war period, and uh, it was a kind of a competitor, if you like, also a, a government-sponsored enterprise that was going to do basically the same thing that uh, Fannie Mae did in uh, bulking up the secondary market and uh, making it possible for more money to be directed in, into mortgage lending. So uh, these things became very big players and, and bigger and bigger, and then they got gigantic uh, just before they met their doom here recently. Uh, and uh, by that time, they they we're holding approximately half of all the uh, home mortgage debt uh, in the United States, uh, about $5 trillion. Yeah, over, over $5 trillion, Bob. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to you in a minute with your other big uh, cause, so hang with me on that just a minute. So, Richard, we've got $5 trillion out there uh, with Fannie and Freddie buying these loans. You mentioned something earlier. Obviously, the, the lending standards went down, but talk to us about this why the fees on these things and how it got securitized and guaranteed that led to this no one doing their homework on underwriting the credit. Great question. Well, number number of pieces in here. Um, first and foremost, and, and I'm glad you bring that up because we've been spending a fair amount of time talking about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but when we really want to talk about, in my opinion, the true roots of this crisis in terms of what starts the banking industry going down the hill, you have got to look squarely at the investment banks of Wall Street, Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs and all the other players, half of which don't exist today, and the investment banking community, as we largely know it, has become you know dissolved or insolvent, uh, and the rating agencies. What largely causes this to go into effect is the ability, again, to take these loans, package them together, and to have the rating agencies, again, we're talking about the big three, Moody, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch, who largely come out and are supposed to be, if you will, the independent arbitrators here. They're the ones that are supposed to be the level-headed ones that, that should determine the level of risks that are associated with buying the bonds that are essentially the payment streams that come and from these loans. What did they rate those wonderful bonds and, and CDOs? Well, they gave them an absolute beautiful AAA stamp of approval, which essentially meant to most investors out there that when you're putting a triple a stamp from a moody's or standard and poor's it is a, is the equivalent of buying a bond from ge capital or someone of that type of set where you're looking at an ultra safe investment and of course 
as we've come to discover, it wasn't. Not only did they miss the market by a little bit, they missed the mark they by missed a ton. A lot, but who was paying them for these AAA rates? Excellent the question. It comes from the investment banks, and this is one of the key things when you talk about where the system goes sideways. You have to go back to the early 70s because initially uh, the rating agencies used to get paid by subscription only. So what that meant was if I was an investor and I wanted to find out how these investments performed, I had to subscribe to their service. Well, in the 70s, Congress said, no, 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 this is far too important. What we need to do is we need to make this information free to everyone. So now the investment banks are largely paying the rating agencies. In some respects, it's almost kind of like the, uh, I would use the example of a baseball game in, in, in which the baseball players would be paying the umpire's salaries. Well, as baseball fans, we wouldn't stand for that, right? Especially if Alex Rodriguez, Rodriguez picked out his checkbook and started writing a check to the third base umpire. I think we as fans would have a problem. Yet that's exactly what was happening. Well, it is. And I want to look at graphic number 27 about Bear Stearns. You and your uh, thing, anatomy uh, piece, you had some of this. Let's read that to the, to the person watching, Stan. Okay, I'm glad I uh, don't need glasses. <laughs> Traditionally, rating agencies view loan-to-value ratios as the single most important determinant of default. Okay, this is from a Bear Stearns document. This is what they say. While we do not dispute these assumptions, the loan-to-value ratios have to be analyzed within the context of the affordable loan situation, which is a reference to the new loans that they're giving for people who don't meet traditional lending standards. Three or four percent equity on a $50,000 house is significant to a family of limited financial resources. In relative terms, $1,500 or $2,000 could easily mean three to four months of advanced rent payments in their previous housing situation. Obviously, there are more delinquencies with the higher loan-to-value loans than with the lower, but there's no tight linear correlation between the loan-to-value ratios. Delinquency rates increase along with the loan-to-value levels, but not proportionately. As a result, the use of default models traditionally used for conforming loans have to be adjusted for CRA affordable loans. In other words, they were selling a bunch of stuff with a bunch of sales pitches that were simply inaccurate, yes or no? Well, that's right, because what it's saying is, gee, the traditional formulas that we use to determine whether or not a house is going to, a mortgage is going to go into default, mm -hmm. we don't want to apply those. And the reason they don't want to apply them because they would have said these loans are going to go into default. Right. And that's not the answer they wanted. Exactly. Now, you have one other big issue, and that's the whole type of mortgage that was being used, the option arms or something like that. Tell us what that is and what it had to do with the price of houses going up, number one, and then secondly, using these adjustable option arms rates and what, what that had to do with your cause. Okay, well the story s is basically they wanted to increase home ownership. They made it easier for people to get mortgages. That increased home ownership. When you have an increase in demand for homes, simple supply and demand, the price goes up. In this case, the price of houses go up. And so one or two years after home ownership starts going up, housing prices start going up. And we're talking about like 1996, 1997. And they keep going up and they keep going up at an accelerating rate. What happens then is that the, we have these, this story out there that people will pay it back and they are paying back the loans because you almost never have to f default if you can always sell it at a profit. So even people who couldn't make their payments could sell it at a profit so you don't see the foreclosures that otherwise what you would have seen. And then what happens is uh, banks, in this case the secondary market, the private secondary market, which was new and comes along in the late 90s as, as the Bear Stearns pitch was saying, uh, start selling these and uses the government story from, they use the Boston Fed playbook. That's exactly what they, they say, oh, these people don't need to have loan to value ratios that are very high. They don't have to be able to pay with normal uh, proof of income. And so they're selling the same pitch. And if anyone says, is that right? They can point to the federal government has all these experts who say, this is absolutely right. So they start selling it. It gets a triple A rating from the rating agencies who should, who were in no position to be able to rate it in the first place because they'd never seen loans like this where they could give a rating. But they gave a rating anyway. And then it gets sold to these people who wind up getting left holding the bag, who are the people who wind up owning the mortgages. Uh, and then they wind up with big losses when the loans go sour, which is what happens. Exactly. Okay, Bob, we just have a very short time left. You've got one other F to talk about, and that's the Fed. Give it to us very quickly. Well, we're looking here at a, uh, at a big fire, as it were, and uh, we can see a lot of the things that happened to start the fire, uh, to some extent, to keep it going after it got started. But we need to remember that uh, the fire needed fuel. Uh, regardless of how uh, loan standards were being formulated, institutions could not lend money if they didn't have any to lend. And so uh, this this issue takes us back to the Federal Reserve System, which uh, controls uh, the amount of money 
circulating in the U.S. economy, uh, to at least to a large extent, controls it. And what we see there is that uh, when the tech bust took place in uh, 2001, the Fed reacted uh, very sharply by uh, uh, accelerating the rate of growth of uh, money and driving down interest rates, and uh, they kept at this for a couple of years, and they created a, a, a monetary regime, uh, particularly in the years uh, 2002 through 2004, and to some extent even uh, a bit beyond that, of extremely easy money and credit. And this is the ultimate culprit behind all of this bad lending, because these institutions had to have money to lend. The Fed created the conditions that gave them that access to funds and uh, allowed them to proceed with the kinds of uh, bad lending they were undertaking. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us. We just have a few seconds left. Stan, I give you the second to last comment. What else you want to put in here in 15 okay, seconds? Okay. I, I, well, I agree with Bob that the Fed, Fed's easy money policy exacerbated things. I don't think it exacerbated them that much. Housing prices were already going up 10% a year before 2001. In 2001, that was from 2000 to 2001, it was 10% increase. And we, they would have continued going up because they stayed at 10% a year for the next three years after that. The Fed's situation made it worse, but it wasn't the, the, the ultimate impact. Richard, you have the last word. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, and this may be hard to, 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 to fathom, especially with my uh, cohort over here who's a lot smarter than I am, I actually believed in what subprime lending could do. One of the things you've got to keep in mind is that people who have less than perfect credit had the ability consistently to get loans for a lot of different things. And it worked for a while in housing, but it went absolutely sideways. It did. Thank you very much for joining us. And Bob, thank you for joining us. Now, as you've seen and heard, this is not a pretty picture. Ask yourself if the remedies being applied by Treasury and the Fed match up to the causes. Ask yourself, as I have asked thousands of people in the last few months, if in fact the folks in charge have any idea what they're doing to the future of your kids and mine. For myself, I feel like that actor in the movie network who yelled, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Finally, tune in next week when we look at where we are now and what the future may hold. Until then, thank you once again for asking us in to talk about things that matter with people who care. A video or DVD of this program is available for $20, plus $5 postage and handling, and in Texas, applicable tax. Visit the McQuistian website at frtv.org or call us at 214-442-1600 for upcoming programs. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government, Hillcrest Foundation, founded by Mrs. W. W. Carruth, and Collin County Business Press, locally relevant, personally profitable.